All right. Well, uh, on that note, let's bow before the Lord this morning before we open his word today. Jesus, we acknowledge that you are King of kings and that you are Lord of lords. We thank you, God, for the revelation of who you are to us, Lord, and the fact that you did come to this world to save us from our sins. Lord, as we continue on in the Gospel of John in this series that we're starting, Lord, God, we pray that our hearts would be open to hear what your Holy Spirit would say to us, Lord, through the Word. God, that you'd help me to expound this Word in faithful, uh, faithfulness, Lord, and that it would come across to the people in the way that you designed it to come across, Lord. God, there's people that have come here this morning with various needs. God, we are a needy people. We, we do need your touch. We need your intervention. Maybe there's someone here today, even that's come this morning, that doesn't know you as their Savior. And God, I just pray that that person or those people that have come would come to know you. Pray for all the people who are listening online as well. In Jesus' name, amen. So in the first 18 verses of the first chapter of John's gospel, we heard the apostle John say some not just good things about Jesus, but some astounding things about Jesus. John told us that Jesus is eternal, that Jesus is it is the intelligence behind the design and creation of everything in the universe. He told us that Jesus was revealed to us as, in Greek, the Logos, the living Word of God, who is God in the flesh that was revealed to humanity. We spoke of how the first few verses of John chapter 1 were intentionally crafted by the Apostle John to, to clear up some misunderstandings about the identity and the life of Jesus Christ. And we talked at how there were dangerous heresies that had arisen during the time of John, which were circulating in the early church that needed to be put to rest, that needed to be brought down. So the Apostle sets the stage by addressing the church through his gospel in the first chapter to break down those barriers and to show the people who their Messiah was. Who their Messiah was, full of grace and truth. God the Son revealed to us by God the Father. But what evidence you might ask, is there to support the uh, statements, the astounding statements that the Apostle John brings forward concerning Jesus Christ? Well, today we're going to talk about that. As a matter of fact, the Apostle John doesn't just make the astounding statements. He backs up his statements by using eyewitness testimony. And this is what brings us to my second message in the series this morning in the first chapter of John, which is all about God the Son being revealed to us through the testimony of John the Baptist. So would you turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 1. We're starting this morning with verse 19. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I am not the Messiah. They asked him, who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. So when John the Baptist was ministering, he was preaching to the people of Israel a message of repentance from sin, 
turning away from sin, recognizing the fact that sin had corrupted them, but expressing that God was calling them to desire to be freed, to be freed from that sin. And, and, and what he did was he preached this message and then he accompanied his message with water baptism as a sign to the people that yes, they desired to be cleansed by God. And, and John did this for a specific reason. You see, people were wondering who this John the Baptist was. They were speculating, some of them were speculating that he might just be the Messiah. And it was for this reason that all this was going around, word was spreading about John, and people from all over Israel were coming to hear his message and to be baptized by him. It's for this reason that there was a delegation of priests and Levites that were, were sent by the religious leaders of Israel to investigate and to see what it was that John was claiming. But John said to them when they first, when they first asked him, well, are, you, are you the Messiah? John emphatically denied it. So the first thing he said. He says, no, I am not the Messiah. Well, then if you're not the Messiah, are you Elijah? Now, for those of you who are not aware, um, just before the time that Jesus was born into the world, there was another miraculous birth that took place before Jesus. There was this man named Zechariah who was a priest who served in the temple of God, and, and he and his wife Elizabeth were were humbly serving the Lord, and they were childless. And one night, or one day, Zechariah was visited by an angel, and that angel told Zechariah that God is going to bless you with a miracle son. They were to call this boy John. He would have a special calling and a special ministry. And in Luke chapter 1, 16 to 17, the angel told Zechariah this. He, referring to their son to come, will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, if you've read the Old Testament, maybe some here haven't read the whole New Test or Old Testament. Maybe you've never read about Elijah, but Elijah was a mighty prophet called by God during a season of Israel's history, and he had a powerful ministry. God used him miraculously in, in many different ways. And in, as a matter of fact, Elijah was one of only two men in the history of Scripture who did not taste death. Only two men were taken by God to be with him. Well, they were still alive. Elijah was one of them. And he was ushered into the presence of God who came down and picked him up in a chariot of fire and whooshed him off into heaven. And the other man who never tasted death was Enoch, but we're not going to talk about Enoch today. Malachi the prophet gave two separate predictions many, many hundreds of years before um, this occurred. Malachi predicted that the Messiah would be preceded by someone who would prepare people to receive him. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, the ancient prophecy was given. I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. That's quite a prophecy. And the second prophecy that was given by Malachi was in the next chapter, in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. 
which states, See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before the great, that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of their children to their parents, or else they will come and strike the land with total destruction. So these two prophecies were given by Malachi. Now, now the religious leaders interpreted Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, which I just read here, in a literal sense. They, they thought that a literal incarnation of Elijah the Tishbite, that was who he was in the Old Testament, Elijah the Tishbite would occur before the coming of the Messiah. When the prophet Malachi announced Elijah would be sent, they imagined that the same Elijah who lived under the reign of King Ahab was to come. And this misconception was why John the Baptist tells them, I am not Elijah. Seems like a contradiction, but let me explain. It's not. You see, these religious leaders that were coming to John the Baptist were coming for a specific purpose. They were coming to corner him. They were coming to try and build a case against him. They were coming, and when they asked him if he was Elijah, they were just they were asking him if he was the incarnation of Elijah the Tishbite from the Old Testament who lived as a contemporary to King Ahab. And John the Baptist was not going to feed into their ideas. He was telling him, telling them when he said, No, I'm not Elijah, he was telling them that he was not Elijah the Tishbite. But Jesus clarifies what the true interpretation of the prophecy given by Malachi meant in agreement with the angel who visited Zechariah before Zechariah and Elizabeth gave birth to Elijah, saying that John would be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, and he would carry the spiritual mantle of Elijah. Where did Elijah, I'm going to ask you, where did Elijah's strength as, as a prophet come from? Did it come from himself? Was he just some extraordinary person that was beyond human? No. The power and spirit that came through Elijah was none other than the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit of the Lord God of hosts, the Lord God Almighty. If anything ever is going to happen supernaturally in this world from God, it's not going to happen because there's going to be some great leader who's going to rise up who has all these great characteristics. It's going to be because the Holy Spirit of the living God is upon that person to preach. See, this is important. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, these people that were trying to corner John, they were coming at everything from the wrong perspective. In Matthew chapter 11, 13 to 15, Jesus states, for all the prophets and law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is the Elijah who is to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. And in Matthew 17, 11 to 13, Jesus tells his disciples in the second half of verse 11, to be sure, Elijah comes and will restore all things. But I tell you, Elijah has already come and they did not recognize him, but have done to him everything they wished. In the same way, the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he was talking to them about John the Baptist. See, John the Baptist wasn't the incarnation of Elijah the Tishbite. John the Baptist, as the angel had pronounced to Zechariah, came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. In other words, John the Baptist's identification of Elijah was not predicated upon his being actual Elijah, but upon people's response to his role. To those who are willing to believe in Jesus, John the Baptist functioned as Elijah functions, for they believed, they, 
John pointed to Jesus, and they believed Jesus as Lord. To the religious leaders who rejected Jesus, John the Baptist didn't perform this function. So after John the Baptist denied being the Messiah or the reappearance of Elijah the Tishbite, the religious leaders asked him another question. They said, so are you the prophet? And John's like, no. Well, what were they talking about with this? You see, there's another prophecy in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 18 and 19, that there will be a great prophet, another great prophet besides one who would come as Elijah, in the spirit of Elijah. Another prophet would appear to lead Israel preceding the coming of the Messiah. It's written, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I commanded him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words. That prophet speaks in my name. So John tells, we won't go into a big dialogue about who this prophet is. Okay? That's not what's important here. John says, no, I'm not him either. And finally they said, well, well, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Those religious leaders, they wanted to know who John was going to say that he was. They wanted to trap him. But John wasn't interested in their question. John wanted to talk about his mission because he wasn't interested in building a following for himself. He wasn't interested in drawing attention to himself. He was there to prepare the way for the Messiah. And John reveals to them who he is. John says in verse 23 of chapter 1, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. And in this, John, John was actually referring to himself as being the fulfillment of the prophecy given by Isaiah the prophet who stated in Isaiah 43 to 5, a voice of one calling in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up. And every mountain and hill shall be made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged places a plain. And the glory of the Lord will be revealed. And all the people will see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In other words, John's trying to tell them, people, I've been sent by God here to declare to you that the time has come to prepare for your, for your salvation, to prepare your hearts to receive the message of the coming Savior, the Savior who will, who will take care of your sins, who will end the suffering of a sin-laden soul. Your, your Savior, the promised Messiah, He's coming. He's coming. And after hearing this, the Pharisees continued to press John with questions recorded in 24 and 25, which said, Now the Pharisees, who had been sent, questioned him, Then why do you baptize if you're not the Messiah nor Elijah the prophet? You see, they were thick. They didn't get what he was saying. You see, to them, they operated so that they could get visual, uh, visual accolades from the people. They're all about them. They're all about elevating their stature, about protecting their livelihoods, about being respected by the people around them. That's what they were all about. And in contrast to them, here was Elijah. Here was, Eli or here was this, the man in the spirit of Elijah. John. Here's John. Who comes to them humbly. And he answers them humbly. And bluntly, without any hesitation, in verse 26, he says, I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. 
This all happened at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan where John was baptizing. And on a side note, scholars believe this reference to Bethany wasn't the Bethany outside of Jerusalem. This was another place. There's been some critical scholar stuff going on surrounding that, trying to figure out where this was. You know where they believe this was? They believe this was the place where Israel crossed into the promised land across the Jordan River where they came out of the wilderness and they came into God's promised land. It is no coincidence that John was standing at this gateway pronouncing the king is coming, the Lord of hosts is coming, and he's going to lead you into the promised land in the spirit. I baptize with water, John replied, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. You see, John didn't want people to think that he was important. John the Baptist was a humble servant of God. His task and his calling was simply to prepare people to receive the message of the life-changing gospel of the Savior. He was serving a greater purpose than himself. He was merely baptizing people in water to prepare and to pave the way for the most important one. The master was coming, and he would not baptize in water, but would baptize in the Holy Spirit. The one who was before him was above him. The one who was before him was the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the one who was and is and is to come, the great I Am, God who has come down in the flesh to save his people from their sins. John says he wasn't even worthy enough to untie the the straps of the Messiah's sandals. Interesting statement. To us, it kind of of falls like, what what is that? We, we don't totally understand that because we, we didn't live in those days. We didn't understand the order of their society. You see, what would happen is if you were a master, like, like, a, like a, a powerful ma- person in society, you would have servants. And before you'd come into your house, the servants would greet you at the door. The servant would say, Master, let me take care of your feet because the, the streets were all dirt. It was dusty. Their feet were dirty. So the, the servant would bend down and would untie this, the sandals, untie the straps, pull the sandal off the feet and would get a basin of water and, and would wash the master's feet before he went into the house. You see, that, that, that's the context of this. See, John was telling the religious leaders that even though he was in the position as servant of the master, the one who he was heralding the coming of was so great, in fact, that he wasn't even worthy to untie his sandals to wash his feet. And we see later on in the Gospels how Jesus, being the master, took it upon himself to wash his disciples' feet. This tells us about the goodness of our God. But John the Baptist said, hold on a second. Don't turn your attention to me. Turn your attention to the one that I'm heralding because he is the great one. And sadly, those Jewish leaders were looking for a Messiah who would come alongside them and would support them in their political endeavors. The zealots of the day longed for freedom from the Romans. They longed for the Jewish nation to become great again. Make Israel great again. That's what they wanted. The greatness of Israel in the same sense, in the physical sense, in the same manner that King David established this kingdom of military might and power. And in their minds, the Messiah would rise to become a great political military leader. But what they didn't understand was that the Messiah was there, first of all, 
to change hearts and bring about a spiritual revolution in his first coming. Prior to coming back as a great military leader, which he will come back as in his second coming. They totally missed the prophecy of the suffering servant, Messiah. They totally missed it. And consider what Isaiah the prophet predicted concerning the coming of the world Savior. We read this at Christmas time, but this isn't just a Christmas prophecy. This opens the gate to understanding who Jesus is and what his purpose was. In Isaiah 53, 1-3, Who has believed our message? And to whom has the Lord, arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Does this sound like a triumphant Messiah to you if you look at things through the perspective of this world? Absolutely not. The religious leaders who were questioning John expected a different kind of Messiah. They wanted a Messiah who would ride onto the world stage with pizzazz. They wanted a Messiah. I'm not sure how they missed this prophecy concerning the great master of the universe and how he would come to the world stage. In the same passage in Isaiah, the prophet continues his description of the Lord saying in verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted. Yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. And verses 10 to 12 of the same prophecy given by Isaiah in chapter 53, it was predicted. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And through, though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, He will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercessors. Intercession, rather, for the transgressors. Amen. And somehow, somehow, the religious leaders of the day didn't see this prophecy for what it, what it was. Somehow, Jewish scholars and rabbis still don't see this. There is coming a day when God will reveal this to them and they will mourn for the one that they had pierced. But, you see, it's no different today. You know, it's no different in the Gentile world. It's no different in North America today. People are looking for a great leader who's going to change their physical circumstances right here and now in the world in which we are living, aren't they? Have we even been pulled into this? I'm telling you right now, no political system in this world is going to change this world. So we might as well stop trying to make it happen. See, because we're putting our eggs in the wrong basket, friends. If we're looking for a Donald Trump without problems, he's not going to come. Someone who's going to get the economy rolling and the money flowing and bring prosperity to all us people following the right directives. Someone who's going to bring Comfort and prosperity and utopia right here and now for all of us. Some are looking for this in Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau to save the planet with miraculous control measures for the climate and climate solutions. Someone who's going to usher us into a, a utopia and bring us into the age of Aquarius. Oh yeah, we laugh. But people are trying to produce these leaders and expecting that they're going to change the world. You know, people in this world are not looking for a servant king. They're looking for a king who will come onto the world stage with pizzazz, someone who's going to come and change the physical circumstances that we find ourselves facing. 
But as in the days of the Gospels, when Jesus walked on the earth, people failed to realize that all of the problems in this physical world stem from one huge problem. We are all bound by sin. And because of sin, corruption has a stranglehold on this world. So then prior to any sort of utopia being ushered into the world, the problem of sin needs to be dealt with. And it needs to be dealt with at the root. Because there is no lasting change unless it is dealt with. There's no new improved Donald Trump out there who's going to change the world. Our Prime Minister's attempts at saving Canadians and the world system is going to fail. The root of the problems are not poor policies. The root of humanity's problems are rotten hearts. Rotten to the core. And the future Antichrist is going to rise and try and tell us that he is the political solution. He's going to come with pizzazz. He's going to come with bling. He's going to come and he's going to deceive even the elect if it were possible. Don't you see the stage is being set for his rise? We're in the last days. We don't know when this is going to happen. But the stage is being set. People's hearts are being turned to look for this leader who's going to solve all of their problems with this pizzazz. Hmm. Whether people realize it or not. The sinners of this world need a savior who will deal with the condition of the heart before any future utopia will be possible. And this is what the Apostle John reveals concerning John the, John the Baptist's testimony concerning the one who was to follow him. He is the one who is heralding the coming of the true savior into the world. He was in the world, and even though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. In John 1, reading from verse 29, John the Baptist continues his testimony concerning the identity of Jesus. In 29, he says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water is that he might be revealed to Israel. You see, the Apostle John and John the Baptist understood what the religious leaders of Jesus' day and the leaders of today's world didn't realize. The right-wing and left-wing activists don't get it. They don't get it. Before the world can be changed, for the better, the Savior of the world must come to them as a sacrificial lamb. You see, the, the lamb was, was a sacrificial animal amongst the Jews. God had taught his chosen people to slay a lamb, to sprinkle its blood as a sacrifice. You see, the lamb was killed as a substitute for the people, and its innocent blood was shed so that sins might be forgiven. However, the blood of lambs that were sacrificially slain during the Old Testament times, they, they didn't take away sin. These lambs were pictures or types which pointed all the way to the cross, to the future, where God would one day provide a lamb who would actually take away the world's sin. All through the years, godly Jews had waited for the coming of the Lamb of God. Now at last, the time had come. And John the Baptist was triumphantly announcing the arrival of the true Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. Now when on a side note here, it's important for us to understand. When John said that Jesus was, would die as a lamb for the sins of the world, he wasn't saying that the lamb was coming and that everyone's sin would automatically be, be forgiven when the lamb died. No, that's not what he was saying. 
what he was really saying is that the death of God's sacrificial lamb would be great enough of a sacrifice to, in value, to pay for the sins of the whole world. Only those sinners who receive the Lord Jesus as Savior and the blood of the lamb is applied to the doorposts of their heart are passed over by death and given eternal life. And then John gave this testimony. It says in verse 32, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him. And I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me, the man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and testify that this is God's chosen one. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them and followed and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went, and they saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Hmm. So John the Baptist understood his position. And he understood his master's position. He didn't even hesitate to tell his own disciples about the greatness of the one that he was preparing the ground for, did he? Through his faithful preaching, John, in fact, John, through his faithful preaching, pointed to Jesus, and said, now this is the one that you ought to follow. You see, John understood that he must decrease so that the Lord Jesus Christ could increase. Now, I want you to get this principle that I'm going to speak about right now. You see, what John did here in what we just read is the hallmark signature of any true herald of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are too many leaders in today's church, it seems, that try to draw attention to themselves as if they were something. When the truth is, if they're they're following Jesus and they're given the task of teaching and preaching and pointing people to the gospel, They are nothing but servants who are not even worthy to untie the sandals of the Lord at entry into his house. And it strikes me strange how people elevate leaders and how many of today's leaders are permitting others to stamp their names on Bibles or brochures to say that somehow they are more important than the average run-of-the-mill commoner. My friends, be aware Be aware of any teacher, preacher, or Christian leader who elevates themselves or permits others to try and elevate them without protesting the attempt. Such leaders reveal their insecurity and their immaturity in the faith. Or even worse, their apostasy. True heralds of the gospel are like John the Baptist who point at Jesus and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. I must Decrease that he might increase. After all, who is Mike Winger? Who is John MacArthur? Who is Charles Haddon Spurgeon or Billy Graham or Pastor Joe or Pastor Jim? Or in the local context, who is Pastor Clint, Pastor Rick or Pastor Matt? What is Hillside Community Church, CCLF, the Evangelical Free Church, or a Or camp like Lake of the Trees that supports the work of the local church. Friends, sometimes we get it wrong. Just like the early church. And some of these other people who are approaching John the Baptist got it wrong. In the early church, some proclaimed that they followed Paul. Some claimed they followed Apollos. Some claimed they followed Peter, Cephas. But who were they? Who are they? God's appointed leaders, regardless of what local organization or ministry they stand for or belong to, are only servants. Only servants. That in the presence of the King of Kings 
are unworthy to even tie, untie the straps of his sandals. Folks, there is no hierarchy or echelon in the, in the true church of Jesus Christ. And I've said this and I'll say it again until we get it. We're bread distributors. We're bread distributors just like the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. We have very little to offer the Lord. We can't feed the multitudes that need the, the gospel, that need to hear about Jesus. We can't do this because we don't have enough. No matter how great we think we are, or what kind of talents or abilities we think we have, we bring only a few loaves and a couple of fish to the table. But the Lord doesn't abandon us and say, no, you guys, too bad, so sad. No, no, no. He calls us and he says, bring me what you have. And when we bring what we have to the Lord and we give it to him and we lay it at his feet, understanding that it is impossible to do the work of God without the anointing power of the Spirit of God upon us, then all of a sudden, five loaves and two fish become enough bread to satisfy the hunger of 10,000 people with 12 basketfuls left over, and Jesus did it again. He did the same miracle again, only this time there were seven basketfuls left over, and 4,000 men or women and children, or men, sorry, without women and children, probably 8,000 people. He did it twice. Why? Because the gift is what's important. The bread is what's important, not the distributor. I must decrease and he must increase. No matter what ministry you take, if God works for you and accomplishes great things and people are fed in the spirit and the bread is multiplied and hunger is satisfied, great, that's awesome to be a participator in the good work of the Lord God our Messiah. But don't get it wrong. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. All eyes upon him. All eyes upon Jesus. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the one who fills us and satisfies the spiritual thirst and hunger inside of our hearts. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we've found the Messiah, that is the Christ, and he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You be called Cephas, which is translated as Peter or Little Rock. And the next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. Finding Philip, he said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was told from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, We found the one Moses was writing about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth! Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is an Israelite, truly an Israelite, in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were under the, still under the fig tree before Philip called you. And Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You will see greater things than that. And then he added, very truly I tell you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God descending, ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Powerful. Friends, the Apostle John concludes the first chapter of his gospel with the testimony of John the Baptist leading to the entrance of of Jesus onto this world stage. Jesus would lay the foundation for a new world order. Jesus, as both God the Son and the Son of Man, would be the Passover Lamb, the Savior of God. He would be born sinless to come into a world that he himself had created out of love to save his own creation from what was destroying them from their sins. As the world's creator, Jesus was both 
the initiator and the mediator of a new covenant in his blood. And he invites all who would believe in him to come to him. Come to him with their brokenness because all of us are sinners and we need a savior. And if we come to the Lord acknowledging our need of him and we place our trust in him, the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is applied to our spirit and we are cleansed and made just as if we had never sinned. And then we become a place for the Holy Spirit to come and dwell in. And the Holy Spirit doesn't come just to dwell in you, just to sit there. Friends, this is what I'm trying to say. This message that Christ has died for our sins is good news. It's the gospel. Why is it good news? Because God didn't just leave us with orphans and he didn't just save us so we could sit there and have his presence inside of us just sitting there. God has called each one of us like he called to his disciples to become his bread distributors. Why? Because it's not your bread that saves anyone, but the bread of Christ that is given to you was meant to be broken off and to be handed to the next person that you have beside you in your life. So don't think of yourselves more highly than you are, but don't don't disparage and say, I have nothing to offer. Don't, don't be in despair about it. You have the bread of life that you offer. It's God's bread. And all you are responsible to do, my friend, is to yield to the Spirit and be obedient and step out and give testimony for what Jesus has done in you and to pass the bread to the next person that's around you. Folks, this is power for gospel living. This is what the church is all about. This is what John, the apostle, was trying to say. That the Lamb of God came in Jesus. And we're going to explore the life and call of Jesus upon all of his people through the book of John. The beautiful thing about this gospel is it's, it's applicable to us today. As, just as much as it was in the first century when it was originally given. So if you're here today and you don't know the Lord, today is the day of salvation. You can come to know him. You just need to humble yourself before God and say, Lord, I need a savior. I know that I'm a sinner. I need your cleansing. Would you come and take away my sin? I don't understand how to live. I don't know how to overcome the things that I struggle with, but I trust in you, God, that you will save me, that you can take my sin and cast it as far as east is from the west, that you can move inside my heart and give me power to become your child. Lord, it is you. It's all about you. So I ask you, Jesus, to forgive me. Come in. You can do that today. You don't have to wait. You have to be willing to leave your old life behind, though. Turn your back upon your sinful living. Say, Lord, I'm willing to let you speak into my life and to change me. That's repentance. If you truly believe in the Lord, you'll come to love him. And when you come to love him, you'll come to obey him. And when you come to obey him, you'll become part of his grand plan of distribution of the bread of life. And that's awesome. Amen. Would you bow in prayer with me? Jesus, we thank you. Thank you for your gospel. Thank you for John, the apostle, and thank you for John the Baptist, who was a faithful herald of your coming the first time. And Lord, now that you have revealed yourself to us and you've died for our sins, we humbly acknowledge our need for you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, that you saved us by your grace. And you call each person here to know you and to walk with you and to live a life of service to you. And we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. May God's grace and peace rest on you in abundance today. Amen.